Very good. This is Fanesha, Desi Pages, Facebook Live presentation. This initiative headed by our CMO, Vaishali Thakkar. And today, all of you who have joined us, let me tell you, it is uh, so fortunate that we have uh, Dr. Aruna Jha, who has joined us to talk live about suicide, the causes and solutions. And throw some light on the current state of affairs, you know, Sushant Singh Rajput, that took his life and the shock is everywhere. He was our Bollywood star. And today's discussion might help a lot of people. So let me first tell you about uh, our expert, Dr. Aruna Jha. You know, she's an assistant professor of social work at the University of Wisconsin at uh, Whitewater, Wisconsin. She is a suicide prevention researcher and an expert on the impact of culture on mental health. She has been active in the field of suicide pre uh, prevention in the US for the past 25 years and held positions as board member of the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, Chicago chapter, the Suicide Prevention Task Force for the state of Illinois and the American Association of Suicidology. Dr. Chai is a master trainer for question, persuade and refer QPR, a gatekeeper training for suicide prevention. So, so much and so much I have been talking to her and it has been such wonderful discussions and I want the world to know about this. Dr. Aruna Jha, welcome. We are privileged to have you here. Thank you very much, Nadita. I feel honored and also very grateful to have this opportunity to talk about a very, very um, serious topic, but a very important topic in the current day and age. So thank you to Panasia, thank you to you, and thank you to Mrs. Tucker for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much for joining. You know, we have, uh, without really talking of anything, we I would just come straight to the point, Dr. Jha, to Sushan Singh Rajput and the current state of affairs. He chose to take his life. People are emotional, angry, fearful, there's so many reactions floating around in the entire social media. People are blaming, they're hurt, they're emotional. What are your concerns or take on this matter? So, Navita, thank you very much, first of all, for phrasing it the way you did by saying that he, he chose to take his life, you know. And for me, the concerns really are embedded in all of the points that you've made, that people are angry, they're sad, they're they are hurting. They are trying to figure out reasons for why it happened. And uh, that creates a situation of high risk, high risk within the community, high risk within the population that is very active on the World Wide Web. And why is it high risk? Because in a situation like this, we don't know how many other people are vulnerable, you know, and how many other people are actually contemplating the possibility of solving all their problems, regardless of what those problems are, by, by following, following Sushant Singh Rajput's example. And so my, my interest in coming onto the radio show and joining you in this conversation is really about suicide contagion risk. You know, so we are elevating, elevating the emotional tension in our communities and we don't know how to track this. So hopefully after today's conversation, the whole commentary will become a little bit more calm, a little bit more rational, a little bit more informed by science because suicide is not very simple to explain. It's a very complex phenomenon. And Sushant Singh Rajput took his re reasons with him. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah, only the person who dies knows exactly why they chose to die in that particular moment. Everything else is speculation. So we need to remind ourselves that it was an act. It was an act that was based on a series of events or non-events, state of mind, but he's the one who perpetrated the behavior. That is why it's a choice. And that's why I like the fact that you're starting the interview by saying that he chose to die. Yes, um, so uh, that's a choice, but uh, you also say many people might be considering this and do not choose. Why do you say that? Well, so we need to, we need to dive into a little bit of data, okay? 
the data suggests that it's it's one percent around somewhere between one to two percent of people in the world, you know, who will who will consider suicide as an option and die by suicide also. But there are literally millions and millions and millions of people at any given point in a seven billion population worldwide that are struggling. They're struggling with life issues. They are struggling with contextual factors. They may be struggling with depression that might be mild depression or very serious depression. And occasionally they might also contemplate ways by which they can just solve their problems once and for all. But those people thankfully do not die by suicide. You know, for, so suicide is described as the tip of an iceberg, you know. What an iceberg is in Alaska, you see lots of those, is a big mountain of ice. But what rises above the water is a very, very small tip, which has the power to sink a large ship, an ocean liner like the Titanic, you know. So what is submerged under the water is the millions of people who are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. And our concern should be for those people. It's a very sad thing to say, this was a huge tragedy and everybody's paying attention to it. But if we focus on the people who are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis, we may be able to prevent so many suicides. And I haven't heard a lot of conversation about Around that. How to, you know, so, how, so how will you explain SSR for taking his life? Why would somebody do it? Is it an act of cowardness that a lot of people uh, say? You know, so when a suicide death happens, um, what we should focus on is not the blame game and the moral judgment of whether it was cowardice or not, all right? Hmm. We need to talk about the fact that an individual was hurting so badly for whatever reason that they wanted nothing more than a solution for their pain. Wow. And this is, not, this is not my my definition. This is the father of the science of suicidology. He was a psychologist in Los Angeles by the name of Edwin Schneidman. And he did suicide research for more than 50, 50 years, wrote many books. And he coined a term called psych ache, psychological pain. And many, many people equate that psychological pain to be to losing a limb. You know, if your arm or your leg gets cut off, it hurts so bad, you hurt for the rest of your life. But people can see that your arm or leg is cut off. When you're hurting psychologically, people can't see how badly you're hurting. So we need to focus on that and everything else that leads up to that desperate desire to, to end the pain can be a multitude of factors. You know, It can be many, many different reasons that actually interweave together to increase the, the stress load the sense of burdensomeness on an individual. And they're just looking for respite from that. Unfortunately, they choose a very radical method to address their pain, which cannot be reversed anymore. So, so Sushant Singh Rajput is an example that is very, very close to literally pretty much every suicide that we know of, you know that it's an impulse that comes together because the pressure increases in your mind and your sense of despair and hopelessness for ever being able to solve this problem of hurt takes over and you say, all that I want is peace. I just want to not feel this bad anymore. So our responses need to be those of compassion, you know, compassion, understand that this is what any one of us can feel in a certain moment, you know. Um, the other thing is that people need to understand that in many ways, what we are hearing on the web right now 
is the kind of reactions that people who've lost someone to suicide do manifest. So having worked with survivors of suicide loss, what we hear over and over again is that there is this sense of betrayal. There is this sense of having been abandoned by the individual. There is sometimes, sometimes, and they feel ashamed for that. There's a lot of anger that comes up and the anger doesn't have a target because the person that you're angry with is actually no longer there for you to speak to them. You know, so it could very well be that had Sushant Singh Rajput been alive today, people would have said, why did you do this? Why did you make this attempt? Why didn't you give me a chance to at least help you? Why didn't you talk to me? Why didn't you come to me, right? So it's that emotion that's getting built up. And because the person that has triggered that emotion is no longer there, you're trying to find who to blame. Who to blame. Right, so that's where the blame game and the finger pointing is starting to happen. And I think we really need to understand that that is survival grief. The survival so grief you said? It, it is survival grief. And survival grief is supposed to be the most complex kind of grief. And there are many reasons for that, which I'd like to also share with you. Please. Yes. So the reason why survival grief is complex and complicated and takes a long time to get over is because suicide is the only form of death that is actually preventable. Oh, so, uh, okay, that's, that's a beautiful point that you've made, uh, the only death that is preventable. What is that? Um, Navnita, I want to say that I can't hear your voice, so I don't know. Please, sorry, adjust. you can uh, you can hear my voice now? Absolutely, and I wonder if your <laughs> audience members also lost your voice. So yeah, so I'll ask the question one more time. So you just said that uh, it uh, is the uh, only the death which is preventable. So that can you throw some light on that? Absolutely. You know, if you if a person gets a, a chronic illness or um, slowly but surely they are moving towards their death. If a person gets cancer, there's very little that you can control in preventing cancer. You can change lifestyles and all of that, but still you do not know if you're gonna get cancer or not. But once you get it, you know, the outcome is not controllable either. If it's an accidental death, you have no control over it because you don't know when it's gonna happen, right? If it's homicide, you can't control it. But when a person dies by suicide, they have taken their own life when none of the other aspects were playing a role in them, right? So when, when, there, are, when there are people observing, discussing, noticing, hearing about suicide, one of, the, one of the emotions that it provokes is that of being a testimony to the rest of us, you know, living in the world because the message they're giving is that the life itself was so bad and things were so hopeless that um, they, they felt that they had no choice but to die. That is a testament to the rest of the world, to the rest of humanity. Are we creating a world that is so hopeless and so mean and so cruel? You know, so, so, mm -hmm. so with survivor grief now, so you are saying it is preventable. So that's what you said, it's preventable. How is it preventable? If I have decided to end my life, yeah. how can I prevent it? All right, so once again, I'm going to use the words that I've heard survivors utter. The, the event has already occurred, like it has happened for Sushant Singh Rajput. But what survivors report is that with hindsight, which we know is 2020, you have clarity of vision, they realized that the person actually gave clues. Ah, there oh my God. Hmm. And you know, suicide is, is an incident that evokes a lot of fear in each one of us. We are scared of talking about it. We are scared that it might happen to somebody that we love deeply. And we are, we are scared that we, each one of us has had moments of vulnerability in our lives. You know, so we always are edging closer and closer to thinking about possibly giving up, right? 
So we need to focus on what were the clues that the person was giving that they were getting closer to, to thinking about ending their lives. So as you just said, SSR also gave clues of uh, paying off the, his help uh, three days ago and he said everything has been taken care of. And do you think those were clues? That in the literature actually comes out as a very big clue. Big clue. Very survivors say that if you find people you love, members of your family, suddenly, firstly, changing their behavior, you know, um, acting differently than what they would normally act like, calling people up randomly. For young people, we try to always educate folks that if they have treasured possessions, you know, like an iPad or a laptop or an iPhone or whatever, a video game, and they suddenly start giving all of those away, and you know that they've been going through stress, wake up and stop and ask them, why are you doing this? What's happening with you? So for me, among everything that I heard, I was alerted when I heard, when I read that Sushant Singh Rajput had paid off all of his employees and uh, made some kind of comments about this would be the last, last time he'd be paying them, you know. So that's where the education comes in. We need to educate people to take these kinds of clues very, very seriously. If people are saying something like, oh, all of my problems are gonna end soon. That's not said lightly, <laughs> take it seriously. Ask them, what do they mean? You know, and all the survivors had said that I got a random call from this person. And now when I think about it, I feel like he was calling to say goodbye. That's you know? the prospect they take. In it's retrospect. Yeah. It's in retrospect. But the thing is, the thought of the person being suicidal is so frightening that we all think it's better not to address it. There are so, so many wrong beliefs about whether it's okay to ask these questions, ask them what's going on, probe yeah. them deeper. And how do we even know? I mean, how do we even know? Right, and this, this issue of how do we even know is both an actual question and a rhetorical question. How do we know? So when you, when you tell yourself that I'm seeing something that's got, my, got me worried, but what do I know? I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist. What you've done is address your own inner misgivings, your own fear. It's not done out of concern for the other person, it's for concern for you because you don't want the chance to ask some serious questions and be mocked or be humiliated or say that you're a drama queen for asking these questions, you know? Yeah. You're worried about looking silly. Yeah. But when it's life and death, can we not, can we afford to be worried about looking silly, you know? Mm -hmm. So you are listening to Fanesia presentation and this is Fanesia Desi Pages bringing Dr. Aruna Jha live and everybody who has tuned in right now, we are to, uh, talking about suicide, uh, the causes and also the solutions. Uh, Dr. Jha, we will one more time come to uh, the same question. Why are people so angry? Why? Why so much of grief? Well, I feel after years and years of doing this work and reading so much about it and researching it, that the idea that it was a, a testimony on the rest of the people in his community, whatever that community was, whether it was so each one of us is a member of so many different groups, right? That's what I mean by community. It could be your professional community. It could be your social community. It could be your family, right? So um, I, I mentioned um, I mentioned uh, Dr. Schneidman's work. I also want to bring in another theory in here, and that is uh, Dr. Thomas Joyner's research. It's years and years long research, and Dr. Jo Joyner is very open about the fact that he was devastated by his own father's suicide. He was an incredibly successful business executive. You know, um, and so he brings his personal passion into the research that he's developed, and he's come up with a theory 
that suggests that people who have increased risk for suicide are people who feel that their belonging to various groups has been thwarted. By thwarted mm -hmm. means it's been negated. Mm -hmm. And it's people who feel that they're a burden on groups that they're attached to, you know. And um, in, in this kind of milieu, when people are feeling that they no longer belong to a community, that they're a burden on their family and their loved ones, or whoever, that they're a burden on society, uh, when, when these people start sort of gaining the capability to actually act on their impulses, act on their thoughts, that small group of people who also have the capacity to perpetrate the act, right? They're the ones who are the most at risk. But let me go back to Dr. Joyner's statement. What is thwarted belongingness? It means that somebody thwarted you, right? You think somebody pushed you out of the group that you wanted to belong to. And that can happen to young kids in school, that can happen to folks in college, that can happen to professionals, you know, and it can happen in the context of intimate relationships also, right? So that's where it goes back to the earlier statement of it's a testament on the rest of us. So how do you deal with the guilt and, and the sorrow that you feel for the lost opportunity to actually be your most human self and reach out a hand to pull this person out of the water. I mean, metaphorically speaking, right? If somebody's drowning, drowning in the sea of sadness and chaos and stress and financial difficulties, I'm using all of the stress factors that can lead to people thinking about suicide. I'm just using Sushant. This may not apply directly to Sushant, but this is context within which people start thinking about suicide, right? <clears throat> the first reaction, depending on how close you are to the person who died or how affected you are by the news of somebody's death, anger can be a very legitimate reaction to what happened. And you have to find a target for anger because if you don't, if you don't find a target on the outside, the only choice you have is to direct the anger inward and basically say, I hate myself because I didn't do anything to save him. And that can happen, interestingly enough, it is not his immediate friends, you know, or people that he was really close to. It can happen to you and me, you know, everybody. everybody. So in this context, because of social media being so effective in creating the sense of community, we are witnessing more and more people expressing anger and trying to direct that anger at one target or the other. And that's why if you, I've not seen all of the media coverage, but if you track even a little bit, the targets are changing. Exactly. The targets are changing. But I think the, testim the testimony of Sushant Singh Rajput applies to society as a whole. And that's why it goes back to Durkheim saying when the social support structures are breaking down and over and above everything else, COVID-19 has done that, right? People are not totally. so much. In the case of Bollywood, possibly the films are not being, you know. Happening, um, not even releasing. They're not shooting the films, you know, they're not meeting up to, to everything's getting delayed. Everything's getting delayed. So the where do you find the target for your anger? You're just making those targets up. So what and, is the solution, Dr. Ta? Well, I think I've been leading up, I've leading, been leading our audience to really talk about solutions because if there's one thing that's bothered me the most in the few posts that I've seen is that everybody's talking about what could have caused it, who could have triggered it, you know, which was the group that, um, that shunned him, that pushed him out, all the rest. So it's what it belonging us, right? what made him feel like a burden, you know, uh, because he was not being effective anymore, um, is that I haven't heard anybody talk about solutions as yet. 
Yeah, and he was such a positive guy. We had we know uh, Shushan Singh was such a positive guy. You know, it's very hard to believe that he of all the people can choose to do that. So you know, all these questions just are so difficult to even figure out on uh, of our myself, uh, uh, let alone people who are close to him. Absolutely. And so, Navnita, if you, for example, start acknowledging that you feel like a survivor yourself, right? Because through media, through watching his movies, you felt that connection, that human connection to him. So you're hurting too. If you're hurting, you're a survivor of suicide loss, right? And it happens to be Sushant Singh Rajput that we are discussing today, right? Um, could you repeat your question again? I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. I'm so sorry because... Uh, how does, uh, like now I'm a survivor, as you said. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I am hurting. Mm -hmm. So what are the solutions? Right. So the solutions really are to make a commitment to, to try your level best to see that this doesn't happen again. And what the research shows emphatically is that if there's one factor that is a preventative factor against suicide, it's social support. And by social support, we don't mean only the family members or friends. It's a community needs to become more caring and more comfortable, you know, in, in reaching out in compassion as human beings, not reaching out in judgment and blame, you know. So I think, I think as society is transitioning from being predominantly a rural society where, you know, everybody knew everybody's business. And the first thing that they did was point fingers at, at anyone that they could point fingers at. We are becoming a more educated society. And as an educated society, we are looking for solutions that are permanent, right? And these solutions have to be everybody being trained in understanding that you can intervene. You don't have to be a psychologist or a counselor or a social worker or a psychiatrist to speak up when you see somebody who is struggling with suicidal ideation, right? And um, one thing that I've heard in some, in some of the posts that I've read or seen is he could have asked for help. That's right. Yeah, and I want to say that that is inaccurate in many ways when it comes to people. So I've also heard, let me juxtaposition that with something else that I've heard that he was very depressed and he was being treated for depression, right? That's right. So I think our, your audience and all of us need to understand what happens when a person is seriously depressed. One of the, one of the manifestations of depression is a loss of energy. And anyone, anyone that has experienced depression will tell you that they don't have en the energy to even get out of bed sometimes. So putting that burden as an additional burden on people who are struggling with serious depression, considering life and death, you know, issues to say you, you could have just asked for help is just unfair. It's just unfair, okay? And what, what people who are that depressed and suicidal say is that it feels like they have a dark cloud around their head, a big dark cloud. The whole world, the sun has gone out of their lives and the whole world is dark and gray. That's what they feel. Within. They feel within themselves and because suicide is a thought disorder, right? It's, it's suicidal thoughts are impeding. Your thoughts are also getting colored by this. I feel, I'm feeling this way, you know, I'm feeling so blue, I'm feeling so, so dark. That when people ignore that, the only way to explain it to yourself, if you're struggling with that, is to say they can see it. They can see it that I'm in this really dark place, but they don't ask me because they actually don't care about me. Oh, that's what, oh my God. When you don't ask, you can actually feel that that's what is happening. Nobody cares about can you can you move your mic again, please? Sorry, I'm so sorry because I am just listening to you so intently that I forget that I am also talking. My so uh, is that the audience may not be able to hear you. 
Right, Dr. Jha. Yes, thank you so much. I'm sorry about that. And uh, so, uh, now when you are saying that uh, I, even if I want to ask a question, I feel I should not ask, the person is feeling that nobody cares for me. Absolutely. It makes him go more absolutely. into his depression. Absolutely right. And when you start feeling that they're not asking me about how I'm doing, Seriously, not just social, how are you doing? No, uh, really, how are you doing, right? If they don't ask you that and you start to, to reinterpret that in your mind because of the craziness of what's going on in your head, as they don't really care enough about me, that's why they're not asking. That's where that sense of burdensome comes, comes in. But that, one, <laughs> just one more thing, but it can also be if I ask, uh, they might just push me away. You know, so that is a myth. And thank you for bringing that myth out into the open. The actual fact is that people who are suicidal are really looking for ways to not feel suicidal anymore. They are looking? They are certainly, one of the key elements of suicidal thought is ambivalence. They are debating, you know, will my, will my situation change? Do I have reasons for living or do I not have reasons for living? So the third theory that we should talk about that is very prevalent here, and it was, it was uh, published by a psychologist named Marsha Linehan. She talks about reasons for living. And when we work with suicidal patients, we really sit down and ask them, can you list for me your reasons for living? You're so sad and your situation is so stressful and you are telling me that life is hopeless, nothing is going to change what is keeping you alive? Because till the moment we go back to the word choice, till the moment they actually choose to act in their thoughts, they haven't yet acted on their thoughts. So you're thinking that it's dangerous to ask them about this and they're gonna push you away and they're gonna deny it. But if they truly believe that you're asking out of a feeling of caring for them, it is okay to even say, I want you to be alive. I'm afraid that you might do something to harm yourself. You're building that trust. And once they know that you're, you're being sincere, they tell you very easily. They tell you exactly what's going on in their head. And they will, they will acknowledge and accept the fact that I am thinking of suicide. So this idea of pushing you away is something that the rest of us who are bystanders, we are onlookers, we are telling ourselves that because we are so afraid of, of this conversation. Yeah, so we. Just a conversation. We need to have this conversation. The conversation. So you are saying the society is giving clues that it's okay to commit suicide? I mean, the way we behave and the way society is formed? Wow, Navita, that is, that is a very loaded question. So um, yes, and so on the one hand, I said that it's the individual that gives the clues to people around him or her that I am considering, considering this option, right? And we have missed those clues. And the question you are asking is, is society in, in many different direct and subtle ways saying it's okay to die by suicide? Yeah. And I think that's, that's how I'm interpreting your question. That's right. And, Thank you so much. You just got me. Okay. And I want to say that, yes, there are very many cultural factors that condone suicidal thinking. And mm. unfortunately, for those of us that live in Asia, and, and I speak to South Asia because I'm South Asian, but it's common across other Asian countries too. Our culture has for thousands of years said, that suicide is an acceptable option in so many different contexts. Like? Like, if you've, uh, if you've lost your honor, you know, if a girl has been raped, if you- Why do you want to be in Hindi? Why do you want to die? Why do you want Yes, absolutely. You have to be honored with your honor, why do you want to die? But it is even in contexts that are less serious than that. I would like to direct our audience today to language on the Indian subcontinent. And that includes Bangladesh and Pakistan and Sri Lanka. It's common. And I believe it also 
spills over into phrases in the Chinese language and in the Korean language. And in my work, I've actually tested this out. People will, in India, they will say, mm -hmm. in a very light context, when they're trying to shame a young boy who's done something naughty, for example. You know? Mm -hmm. In parenting, parents will say, Agar aisa hoga, to main to sharm ke mar mm. right? And I have found it really fascinating that we use language like that, even in the context of very, very happy occasions. You know, so, oh my God, and that happens in the West too. And girls are very prone to that. They'll say, oh my God, I'm so happy today I could die. Mm. So what we are doing is we are programming our brains to consider suicide as an option. Wow. That, that is this rumination, you know, and what happens in the progression of suicidal thinking is because you've, you've been exposed to so many contexts in which a suicide is one way to solve a problem, one of many, many ways, if you are feeling optimistic and happy and cheerful, when you have a stress moment in your life, you consider a lot of options, you know? And suicide may be one fleeting thought that comes, you know? Mm. Oh yeah. And I hear young people, I'm in a university setting, I hear young people say this, oh, if nothing else works, I could always kill myself. Yeah, that's the last option I could choose. And no, they're saying it, they're saying it with a smile on it. And we, as listeners, we don't stop them and say, why did you just say that? Okay, so we need, to, we need to start monitoring the many different ways in which we are conditioning ourselves to consider suicide as an option. But in India, the history has for thousands of years been that suicide has actually been also considered a very honorable thing. Hmm. You know, we worship people that have died by suicide my roots are in Rajasthan. Rajasthan had a long tradition of sati. Yeah. And there were, there were temples made for satis all over the state where people go and worship to this day, to this day, right? What is it about our ethos on the subcontinent that we think suicide is honorable, right? And, and so, yes, culture, culture is giving messages and we need to have people be alert to where the culture is giving you a life negating message. Because the key, the key piece along with, I said a little while back, there is this ambivalence in people and there is this, this struggle between reasons for living and reasons for dying, you know, when you, when you overlap that with the fact that in certain contexts, your upbringing has said that the only options for certain situations is suicide, mm. then you will consider suicide as that option, you know? And as your, as your depression or your moodiness starts to increase, those alternative ways to solve problems, you know? I could Thanks. go, ask, I, if it's finance, I could ask my friend for a loan, I could go live with my mother and father for some time if I'm being ev evicted from my house. Or, okay, if I broke up with my girlfriend, there's other pretty women in the world, I'll find another woman, right? You have those options and you're feeling good. When you start feeling really depressed, that starts to get narrower and narrower and the suicidal thinking starts taking over. Maybe the best thing for me to do is to just end it all once and for all. Let me just end it. And what I want to say is that thoughts rise and fall. They rise and fall all the time. If we can buy time, and that's the only, only strategy to be used, if we can buy time and slow those thoughts down, we can reverse that trajectory of suicidal thinking and bring them back. But you first have to buy time. So you have to say, all right, you know what? You're thinking about all these things. Can you delay the decision? Let's hold off for a couple of days. See what I'm saying? Beautiful. My God, it's so, so, so wonderful. So with SSR, uh, SSR you, if somebody could have bought that time, because he would not have just gone away. And that's no, what... Uh, and see, but 
along with what you just said, which is very important, we also need to acknowledge those of us that are that didn't know him personally or didn't know what his life stories were, because there's some very, very disturbing things that are coming up about his romantic breakups and all the rest of that, right? But if you if you respect the fact that I'm saying that even those people were just human and they didn't know the impact of what they were doing, yes, it could have been controlled. You know, I I think what we need to understand is that there is there is ways to break up romantic relationships also. You know, you don't have to have a violent breakup. You can have an amicable breakup. And the people who are struggling with romantic loss, because I know, unfortunately, I know a number of suicides that happen in the context of relationship breakups. It is that you will learn to love again. Mm. It's inevitable. If you've lost one love, you will learn. And this message of mine is to those audience members of yours who may be struggling, you know, with these kinds of thoughts, with these kinds of situations, please hold off, please hold off. Remember that these thoughts will become weaker. And when they become weaker, your natural emotional mental strength will come back. And there are many, many, many ways to solve pretty much each and every problem that we but when you say that he, one person is so much in pain, how do does the person feel that this is the reason I don't want to do commit suicide and uh, it can relieve that pain for that person? I mean, what is, what is it that can bring him out? So reasons for living. Reminder of reasons for, for living. You know, we know anecdotally and from, from the research too, with suicide attempt survivors, people who tried to kill themselves and then survive that. Many, many people, many, yeah. Many, many, many people. And what many of them report, maybe not all, but many of them say that they had that one very dark period in their life. And when they got out of it, they never went back to that place again. So one example that I want to give is San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. You know, over a 10 to 12 year span, there were more than a thousand suicides by people jumping off of that bridge. And now they have a nice barrier, thank God, and people can jump. But among the thousand plus people that jumped off, there were a few people that actually survived that very steep fall of more than 150 feet. Okay. Okay. And what they reported, so there was a researcher that followed them and asked them, you know, what made you jump and what were your last thoughts before you hit the water? And their last thoughts across the board were, oh God, I don't want to die. Hmm. Okay. So for the people who are vulnerable to be this kind of thinking, we need to remind them that this thought comes and it passes. You don't need to act on the thought, just hold off. Do whatever it takes to hold off for a little while, right? But I've also said that when you're that depressed, you don't have that energy. So it is to you and me, you through your radio show and me through what I'm doing right now, everybody listening to basically say it's up to me to recognize that and to say hey buddy you don't need to do this and you can do that to complete strangers you can do it to complete strangers you know you don't have to even be somebody that knows because in in our culture in the indian culture it's very much like are hum to usko jante bhi nahi hai. we don't even know that person you know i'm not going to interfere and we have this very strange kind of idea that private business is private business. And a lot of social evils are being perpetrated in private business contexts, you know? Mm. So bystander training is really about saying to people, don't be a passive bystander. If you say something, do something. So that brings me to this question of the QPR training that you do, uh, Dr. Jha. And this is, this is something I really want to know more about. And All I think right. my listeners would love to know about it because uh, uh, like CPR, you know, when you said QPR and I was like, okay, sounds like CPR. 
Absolutely. And you've actually zeroed into what the premise of naming this training was, uh, the premise of calling it QPR. So there's a psychologist in Washington, in Washington State by the name of Paul Quinnett. He is the creator of the QPR training module, and it's the most widely disseminated gatekeeper training. Hmm. A gatekeeper, today in Navneeta, you are a gatekeeper because you have access to a large audience that's listening to you, right? So gatekeeper training is training provided to anybody that is motivated to learn more about what makes people suicidal and what can they do about it if they see somebody who seems vulnerable to suicide. And Paul Quinnett is very, very emphatic about the fact that you do not need to be a mental health professional to do this. Anybody can learn this. So QPR is an acronym. Q stands for question, P stands for persuade, and R stands for refer. Question is to know, and that's what the training teaches, know what kinds of questions open up the conversation to the person actually acknowledging that they are suicidal. What kinds of questions will actually make them shut down further? Hmm. And it has to do with, you know, in the field we say, don't do suicide interrogations. Yeah, oh my God. Okay. It's like, are you suicidal? You know, whatever. Be compassionate, be kind, you know, be thoughtful. Let the person know that you really have the time and you're willing to listen to the story of their pain. So sometimes just sitting and listening is more than enough, but you question and you understand how intense are the feelings? How frequently do the thoughts come? And how likely are they to move ahead? into behavior. Those are the questions you're asking. And it's just a conversation. You're, you're asking the way I'm modeling you asking this, okay? Persuade is to persuade them to consider life as an option. Hmm. Okay. Again, That's as a beautiful option. consideration though. <laughs> yes, and persuade them to hold off on the action till you've been given a chance to find them more solutions. So it does, it does prompt the individual who's practicing QPR to make a commitment to helping this person too, right? And many times, I think that's what people don't wanna do. But the question from me to all of the world and all of community is how much is a human life worth? You know, is it worth half an hour of your time? Is it worth one hour of your time? I'm not gonna answer that question because I would hope that the audience has a very loud answer, you know. You, you brought tears to my eyes by asking that question, Dr. Jha. How yeah. much is a life worth? Because yeah. it totally boils down to a lot on that, that how much are we yes. uh, passionate yes. and considerate yes. and uh, yes. looking at a person and figuring out and also having that intensity to ask that question. Absolutely. And so... One of the biggest risks of somebody acting on, on their thoughts is leaving them alone. Whereas if I hadn't actually encountered this in my work personally, I would not have said this with so much emphasis. Family members actually say that they thought that the best thing they could do was leave the person alone. Oh, I'm using Hindi, but I can translate in English too. Don't bother that person because he's so fragile, right? He needs to come out of this on their own. And I have demonstrated over and over again that they can't come out on their own. So in India, one of the biggest um, challenges that we have and is that this whole awareness about suicide and suicide risk is very recent, right? It's only in 2017 three years ago, that suicide was decriminalized. Prior to that, suicide was a crime. It was a crime without a perpetrator because the victim and the perpetrator were one and the same, but it, but it was still a crime, which brought about a lot of stigma attached to, to suicide. So if people were suicidal, they would not talk about it. I am gratified that at least we have started to, to have a conversation about it, right? But the other thing is when it's so recent that we've said, no, let's bring it out of the darkness. We let's bring it out of the closet and start doing something to help it. We don't have the mental health resources 
you know, so if a person is really struggling and you say, why don't you go and talk to a counselor? You've actually lost the opportunity to actually get them out of that thought process, which is why Dr. Quinette's idea is so, so powerful. He says, anybody can do this. It doesn't matter how you say it, it's, it's, it's showing the caring one way or the other, right? I'm there for you, I'm there for you, that's what it is. And R is refer, and why I just talked about the state of affairs in India right now is because in the US, refer would mean taking a student to the counseling center, you know, in a high school, taking the student to the social worker. So QPR training is done for teachers also. You know, for community members to say, hey, would you let me call 911, you know, and maybe, maybe we could escort you to the emergency room, right? Where a trained mental health professional would do a risk assessment and decide a course of treatment. India is so big and the communities are so diverse that if we start telling ourselves that, yeah, there are counselors you can talk to, or there's this, that, and the other, we are losing, we're missing the opportunity. We need to, we need to have college students trained to say, you can intervene with your friend, you know? And I want to widen the lens and say, then the referral has to be to people who are willing to give that kind of constant support till the individual is out of, out of the crisis, you know? So a group of friends could be a referral. You know, it's like, hey, let me bring in all of our buddies. Let's all sit down together. Let's come up with a plan. We are not going to leave you alone for the next two weeks. Awesome. That can be a strategy, right? So mm -hmm. we have to adapt what QPNR literally means because in the West, there are lots of resources that are formally trained resources. In India, we have to develop a groundswell of movement to train the whole public, right? So that's what QPR is. Anybody who's willing to get trained to say, I will train other people, I will learn what the signs and symptoms are, and I will step up and do what's need needful. It's a gatekeeper training. So you're a gatekeeper today, Namita. Thank you for making me uh, the gatekeeper, Dr. Jha, because uh, it's so insightful. I am sure everybody, there's so many people who have joined us and they are uh, really finding it so profound, all these thoughts. And thank you for bringing all this. And you know, uh, the world has been talking about it, but considering uh, once a person has gone and we are the survivors as uh, suicide survivors, as the, you say, uh, mm -hmm. we have so much more responsibility and figuring out our responsibilities and going ahead is a big thing. People who have just joined us, we have this as a Fun Asia Desi Pages presentation under the leadership of our CMO, uh, Ms. Vaishali Thakkar. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Dr. Jha, coming back again, uh, once you, if you have to, whatever discussions which we have done today mm -hmm. from the beginning, what are your final thoughts if you have to leave uh, our listeners and our um, people with something which is important? Okay, all right. Navita, I would like to leave the audience with an anecdote and I hope it's a teaching anecdote. Um, so I formed a coalition in Illinois in 2005 that was called the Asian American Suicide Prevention Initiative. And we were the first coalition to really bring out into the open the issue of suicide in Asian Americans. And one day I got uh, an email from an associate of mine who was trying to address suicide in African Americans. She just picked up this email from someone who posted on the internet saying, I am hurting so bad, I am devastated, I'm worried about my family, can somebody help me out? And um, Donna Barnes is a psychologist. She forwarded that email to me and she says, Aruna, I think this email is from India. Can you, you might be able to help this person. This person is Mrs. Arnavaz Damania. And uh, I'm choking up. Oh my God. She lost her son-in-law to suicide. And she was worried about her daughter and her grandchildren who were very little. Her daughter was also quite young. And when I corresponded with her, Mrs. Damania said to me, 
She says, I'm, I know what my family is going through. I know how much we are hurting. I don't want anybody else to feel this pain. So I said, okay, so what do you want to do? And she says, I want to start an organization that addresses suicide in youth. Okay, that was 2005. We are into 2020 now. Connecting NGO is a nonprofit in Pune that has been doing stellar work all these years. They have reached out to thousands of people. They have a crisis hotline. They have a walk in counseling services, go and do trainings in schools and in front of professional organizations, you know, reducing the stigma and building awareness that people need to engage. So those are, my, those are the thoughts that I carry with me all the time. That it took one woman, and this is my message to survivors, survivors who are, were very close to the person who died, or survivors like you and I, who did not know the decedent, but were still impacted by the suicide, that the only way through your grief is through action. Yes. And I can say this with confidence, survivors in the United States and Canada and Australia, there is testimony after testimony where they are saying, when I got involved in advocacy and helping somebody else, that's when I was able to come to terms with the fact that the person who's gone is not going to come back, but I can save somebody else's life. Suicide is a meaningless death. It's meaningless, yes, because it was preventable. The only way to find meaning in it is an action. I would like to see the conversation on the web shift towards how can we all come together to help the next person who might be contemplating following Sushant Singh Rajput's actions? What do we need to do at the grassroots level, at a bigger systemic level? The industry that is so riled up about this, you know, that is an industry that has the greatest amount of wealth in India. It's all centered in that group of people that Sushant Singh Rajput was trying to belong to. What are you going to do about this? How are we gonna translate this rage and this grief and this passion into action? Those are my thoughts. I would like to see Connecting NGO be replicated in every city, in every village in India. It's gonna take a lot but it can be done, it can be done. We just need to come together and be intentional and say, yes, we're gonna make it happen. We have so much talent in our midst. We have the resources, we lack the will. We need to find the will to do it. We will find the will to do it. You know, when you were saying this, there was one more point that just suddenly came into it, even if you have, finalize your thought, you know, you just mentioned that there would be others who would be doing and we need to find that help. Yes. What do you mean? So uh, there would be other people who would be probably wanting to replicate the same thing. I said, we, you mean the suicide? Suicide. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've been doing these trainings since 1993, at least. So that's 27 years now, right? Mm -hmm. I have not given one talk. It could be five people in the room. It could be 150 people in the room where there hasn't been one, two or more people who've been directly impacted by a suicide loss. Meaning just now something has happened and I'm copying it to do it or no, something? No, who have had either suicidal thoughts in their own lives, who know what suicide means, who either have lost someone they love deeply to suicide and never told anybody about it, who've made attempts that they haven't sought help for, you know? Those are the people who are at highest risk. The research shows that suicide survivors are at the highest risk for a suicide attempt themselves, okay? And those are the people that I am speaking to directly today. I hope they are looking into my eyes and my message is for them 
channel your impulses into advocacy and activism. You do not have to follow the dictate of those thoughts. You know, get the help that you need. If you need medication, get medication. But I do want to, I do want to add another word of caution about medication as well, because I have worked with families where part of their grief is, oh, but he was getting treatment. He was working with a psychiatrist or a psychologist or this, that, or the other. When, when your loved one works with a professional, it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to also continue to be caring and alert. Hmm. Because a psychiatrist may see your loved one once a month and prescribe the medication. A psychologist may see them once or twice a week at the most, sometimes not, not even that much. But these thoughts don't go away in that one visit. You have to work the way back, right? You were saying reverse the thought process. And I said, time is the tool that you use. So it takes time to bring them back to a level of normalcy, right? In that time, the family needs to continue to be vigilant. The friends need to be more caring, reach out a little bit more, check in a little bit more, right? And the additional risk that there is, is that when it's a situationally driven suicide, right? Some, some people are using words like bullying. It, I don't know that it was bullying that caused it, right? But we do hear of cases in the US where particularly young children, their response to bullying in schools is a suicide attempt, right? So there might be some validity to, to considering bu bullying as a trigger factor. You, you take, a, take a young person to treatment, they start getting the antidepressants, they start to feel better. But the context of bullying, just as an example, doesn't go away. No, right. So when they were very depressed, they didn't have the energy to act on, on their desire to end it all by dying. Okay, it, it, wow. takes, it takes energy to build up to that point. The antidepressants start working and antidepressants are not working with thoughts. They're only working with the mood, right? So suddenly you find the energy going back up and the person is alert and very aware that the situation hasn't changed at all. So the risk levels actually go up, they don't come down. And it's only when the family is educated to the fact that there is a certain period of time when the risk has actually increased because this person is now out and about moving and sitting there and saying, oh my God, nothing in my life has changed. That's when they find the energy to actually act on their thoughts and their feelings. So those, and they take the drastic step, they can take the drastic they, step. They could, they could consider taking the drastic step. Or so change the, their life to a better one with the mood change. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, when, when the intensity of thoughts and, and the, the pre preparation to die was not that, that intense, you know, and the trigger factors may not have been that impactful, when the mood elevation starts to happen, you start to feel better and you say, okay, I'm going to start going to the gym, I'm going to start running, I'm going to start reading books, I'm going to listen to music, I'm going to do this, that and the other, right? They are already taking control of shaping their environment and ch changing it towards reasons to live, right? Correct. But if the context is really complex, there is a possibility that the risk level actually goes up. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. It has been such an insightful talk, Dr. Jha. You have brought in so many different uh, things in in many, many ways. And um, I'm sure my listeners uh, have felt because I'm getting comments from everywhere. And uh, is there a way that uh, some of them can, if they want to touch base with you, is there a way that they can? And can I just uh, uh, channel them? Absolutely, Navnita. I would like for them to continue to send their comments to the Fun Asia pages and for you to curate those comments and I will give you um, give you my email address and if people really want to talk about something or learn more 
about the things that I've talked about today, then um, they should write to me and hopefully, you know, we can all band together and say, all right, we want to, we want to pool our resources and actually start addressing these issues in a more systematic way, you know. Um, do we have a couple of minutes? Um, you can use it because we're not time bound, but we have finished our one hour. That's what it is. But then we okay. can. Uh, yes, That's please go ahead. Mm. Every year, about a million people die by suicide. Okay. And in addition to everything I, as I've said, we talked about psychic, hopelessness. Hopelessness is the key thing that we also need to think about. I want to leave the audience with a final word. There is nothing in life that is so powerful that you have to give up hope. Beautiful. Keep your hopes alive, keep your hopes alive whether it's COVID-19 or everything else. This too shall pass. Remind yourselves of that. Stay hopeful because we can change the context if we all band together. I don't remember who it was. I think it was Margaret Mead who said, don't ever doubt that a small group of people with the right intent can change the world. Because and that's nothing, because nothing else can. And I love the way you have shouldered it to bring this change around. Thank you, Dr. Jam. Vanisha is really, really thank you, thankful that you joined us today, Dr. Aruna Jha. And um, uh, thank you so much. That's what. Uh, and the last, we, we are the ones who can change it and great messages. I want to thank Fanasia as well. This was a big step that you took, Navnita, and you would not have been able to do it without the support of Fanasia. So continue to do the good work that you're doing and hopefully we'll have more conversations like this and hopefully your audience will ask for more conversations like this. Awesome, thank you. You have a wonderful evening and let's do it. Make the changes in the world. Outstanding. I'm with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.